Okay, so I've been a brony now for over seven years, and something I wanted to do over the last couple months is just go back and rank all the two parters in Fred Tuba's Magic. I've seen a number of people on YouTube and DeviantArt and elsewhere come out with these top five lists or their bottom five lists talking about which episodes they love and which ones they hate. And the two parters always tend to come up a lot when people are talking about these shows because at the end of the day, the two parters are some of the more prominent episodes and things that people remember a lot. And I like a good top five list as much as the next guy, but. For this video, I really want to just go all in and just rank all of them. You know what I mean? Aside from the usual disclaimer of how this is just my opinion and you can like whatever you like, I'll say up front that in the grand scheme of MLP, the two parters are pretty all right. I feel like most of them are either above average or in the upper echelon of episodes in French of His Magic. And even the ones at the bottom, like, they're really only average. Like, they're not that bad. I think that's a testament to how the writing team used these two parters to go all out and tell stories that normally wouldn't fit in to your standard 22-minute episode. So for this list, I'll be ranking every two-part episode in MLP. So that's eight season premieres, six season finales, and the ending of the end, which technically isn't a season finale, but it's close enough. So that's 15 two-parters to rank. Uh, so let's not waste any more time. Let's just jump right in. So starting off this list, we have number 15, the worst two-parter in my opinion. And I realize some people may think that, oh, this isn't the worst, uh, or this isn't that bad. And you're right. I don't think it's that bad. I mean, it's not the worst episode in the show by a decent amount. But at number 15, I had to put the season seven finale, Shadow Play. Now this, to me, is easily the most forgettable two-parter. Uh, to me at least. So much of it feels like they just took different aspects from other two-parters and put it all together to create this bland, unmemorable experience. You have a quest for keys to unlock something, which reminds me a bit of Twilight's Kingdom. You have an evil spirit using jealousy and bitterness to corrupt a previously kind and heroic pony. That sounds like Friendship is Magic to me. You have characters digging through books and developing new spells in an effort to solve the conflict. Sounds like the crystalline to me. And along with this is this talk about giving up and destroying the elements of harmony. I mean, this sounds a lot like Princess Twilight Sparkle to me. And then you top it all off with this underwhelming redemption arc for a character we barely know and never see again afterwards. That's pretty much the episode in a nutshell. And really all this, those reincorporated elements from previous two parters, it's just less interesting than what it was in those previous ones I just mentioned. Even the pillars, like, they add some depth to the world. I mean, they just feel like they're just there to give the main six another set of counterparts, only this time it's ancient. I would have been all right if they only had Swar Star Swirl there, as he was an established character from earlier seasons. Now, with that said, like I said, it's not like this two-parter lacks merit. I mean, I think Twilight has an interesting story of working hard to meet her idol, only for him to immediately think she's reckless for doing so. And then the rest of the episode is her is her trying to impress him, even hurting Starly's feeling in the process. Speaking of which, I also like Starly in this episode. She very much seems like someone that has mostly moved on from her past, but is still bogged down by Star Swirl's once a villain, always a villain mantra, and Twilight's refusal to stick up for her. Star Swirl learns his lesson by the end, but for whatever reason, he gives Twilight all the credit for it, when really Starly is the one questioning everything the entire time. So I found that kind of weird, uh, but again, it's not too bad. I mean, but really on the whole, I mean, this two-parter isn't the worst thing in the world. I mean, there are plenty of worse episodes in the show, but I just feel like when we're comparing it to the other two-parters, it's just the worst one or the weakest one, in my opinion. So for that reason, I have Shadow Play at number... Now we're moving on to number 14, and I know that this one's going to be controversial. Not so much because it's bad or has a lot of haters or anything, but because people look back on this one and think, how could you have this one this low? And I, I was a bit surprised to have it this low. I thought that a lot of the more controversial ones would be lower. But at the end of the day, the reason I have this one this low is because I feel like it doesn't give me as much as some of those other ones that we'll be talking about later. So number 14 
I have Friendship is Magic, the series pilot, and it definitely does its job well for being a pilot. Like, it definitely introduces the characters, it introduces the world, it gives us some good moments along the way, but I feel like at the end of the day, that's pretty much it. It's a pilot meant to introduce us and reel us in more so than be something that stands on its own. And I think at the same time, with it being a pilot, there's a lot of the awkwardness and growing pains that come with being a new show. So like you'll have like random stuff that they'll experiment and never mention again, like Spike not knowing how to spell big words or just having random rock guitar soundtrack for whatever reason. I mean, there are definitely good moments in the two-parter. Like my personal favorite is right at the beginning where Twilight turns down Moon Dancer's invitation, but more so because that's the setup to Amending Fences, which is one of my favorite episodes in the entire show. So I get a lot of retroactive enjoyment out of that. You know, part one and part two are kind of similar where each of the main six have a scene that really introduces us to their personalities. Like with part one, just being what they're into, like what they do for a living. And part two being more so how they embody whatever element that they're going to become. For the most part, it's pretty good, but there are just some minor nitpicks. Like when Applejack was telling Twilight to let go, like she could have just told Rainbow and Fluttershy, like, they would be there to catch her. Like she didn't have to be vague and be like, Oh, just listen to me. Like if anything, I feel like that just teaches people to be blindly listening to people. You know, like there's also the scene where rarity rips off one of Steven magnet scales. I mean, again, why couldn't she just tell him what she was doing? You know, you know, stuff like that, you know, like, you know, not big issues, but more so just random nitpicks. You know, like, you know, stuff where I wonder for a few seconds, like, what if what it is these characters are demonstrating with their actions. There's also the villain Nightmare Moon, who is definitely one of the weaker villains in the show. Like, while her overall plan has some pretty dire consequences for all of Equestria, you know, like, with Perpetual Night, like, being an existential threat, these effects are barely felt in the two-parter. Everything feels very small and localized to what the main six are doing in the Everfeed Forest. And I feel like we didn't really get a lot of the stakes, you know, that this villain presents compared to what we'll see later on in the show. So I thought that was kind of a missed opportunity there. And I feel like whenever she was on screen, like she just wasn't as intimidating as a lot of the other villains. She just, she just didn't draw me in as much. She's not the worst. I mean, I feel like Stygian is one of the more forgettable villains in the grand scheme of things, but she isn't much better, in my opinion. I feel like in many ways, she's the tamest villain of all, like given how she's presented with all these awkward issues I mentioned earlier. Like, so I feel like to an extent, like she suffers from presentation issues. And I, again, at the end of the day, I just feel like Friendship is Magic is a pretty straightforward episode. Again, it's, does its job well. I mean, I like the episode, but I feel like compared to other two parts, it just doesn't do as much to me. It doesn't draw me in as much. I feel like when you watch it, it's just something that you have to watch because it's the premiere and it introduces you to all these things and sets up the world and that type of stuff. So it's fine, but not really to the extent as what we'll see in other two parters, which definitely have more ambition with what, what they want to do. So because of that, I have Friendship as Magic. Now we're moving on to number 13. And I'll be honest, when I started putting this list together, I was not expecting this one to be so low. I mean, for the record, I did an entire rewatch of all 15 two-parters before putting this list together. And I remember at the time watching this one that I it was fine. Like, But I feel like there were other episodes that were worse in it. And... I was not expecting this one to be this low. I feel like I felt like there were other episodes that had mo bigger flaws in it that would cause it to be lower. But then when I really thought about it and I really thought about how it made me feel watching it and what impact it had on me, I felt like this one just didn't do as much for me as some of the other ones, even if the other ones have mo bigger and more noticeable flaws to it. And so at 13, I'm a bit surprised by this. I'm putting the season 8 premiere 
school days. Now, out of all the two parts, this is the one that feels the most like a regular 22 minute episode. You know, it definitely feels different, like in the sense that it's trying to introduce essentially the final era of the show where we had the school of friendship and the creature six really becoming more of the focus moving forward in these last two seasons. And like friendship is magic. A lot of this episode feels straightforward by the numbers. Like as a concept, the school of friendship isn't the worst idea in the world. I like how this episode tries showing how friendship is different enough from other fields to where it shouldn't be taught conventionally. Even if I think future episodes ignore this. The episode was a good enough introduction to the Creature 6, who I definitely like, and I feel like we this episode definitely got us a bit of an interesting introduction where we see them not liking each other at first, like they even though they're lumped together right from the start, and then to see them start to become friends after having some kind of animosity based on them being different creatures, like they definitely start to get a lot of screen time, and that was fun to see. I also like how this episode tries to address the racial issues that have kind of bubbled beneath the surface in the early seasons, such as how the cultures of other species are considered less civilized than that of ponies, like griffins are selfish, dragons are greedy, yaks are reckless, changelings are evil. You know, previous episodes have already uh, done some work to address this issue by introducing us to, like, characters that are exceptions to the rule, or by opening the door for these cultures to be reformed. So, like, you know, like the first thing I said, like, you know, like with you have Ember, like show being not as bad as a dragon, or Gabby being a good griffin, Thorax as a changeling, and with the other thing, like we get hints that like the griffin and changeling cultures are being changed and being reformed to be less toxic, and so on and so forth. So there's definitely some some uh, culmination that comes from those previous episodes in the sense that the show is trying to be more inclusive regardless of what you know species you are and i'll admit that along those lines it's interesting to see like a pony like naysay being a pony supremacist and having the other creature characters peddling stereotypes and animosity between the different cultures and in turn it shows how the school of friendship is designed to promote greater understanding of these cultures so that was definitely the highlight for me in this two-parter, definitely seeing that dynamic play out. But I feel like if you take that out, like, again, like, I feel like the stakes are lower than other two-parters. There isn't really much justification for this to be a two-parter other than that this is supposed to usher us into a new era of the show. And it's not bad. I'm not saying it's a bad episode per se, but I feel like it has the same issue as Friendship is Magic, where a lot of it serves to set up future stuff and sort of culminate, basically build off the work of other episodes, more so than be something that is memorable or that great in and of itself. So because of that, I have schooled. Now we're moving on to number 12. And again, this is another pretty big surprise to me. And I feel like this definitely might be controversial in the MLP community. Like when the first time I watched this two-parter, like I was so out of it. I was so underwhelmed by it that I was expecting this to be at the bottom. But then like when I did this rewatch that I did, I, you know, I started to see a bit more merit to it. Like I started to be a bit more fair to it. And I feel like through that, that definitely made me enjoy this two-parter more than the others. It still has flaws, but I feel like, compared to how I felt before, like it's not as bad. So at number 12, I have the season nine finale, kind of. I mean, we have the ending of the end. Now, this is the final two-parter, and I think there are both merits to this episode, but also pretty massive flaws. I feel like the first of which is the reveal of Discord being Grogar and orchestrating this entire crisis as a way of testing Twilight. Now... I, like, I know that later on I might talk a bit more about my opinions of Discord, but I'll, I'll say up front that Discord is not one of my favorite characters by a decent amount. And I feel like this episode is one of those reasons that I'm not super crazy about Discord's character arc. I feel like this episode really, really is a big knock against his character arc. Like I get the, that the whole premise of Discord's redemption is that he's complicated, has weird he has weird ways of expressing his intentions. 
And he definitely does stuff that's questionable at points. But I feel like this is such a massive leap in the wrong direction, especially after Twilight's Kingdom. I feel like if Twilight's Kingdom didn't exist and we didn't have this story arc of Discord already turning on the elements of Harmony to work with Tyrick, I feel like this episode would be a bit more justified. Like it's, it would still be bad, but it wouldn't be as bad as with the existence of, you know, like that episode. I feel like with that episode existing in Discord already having, you know, like been like a major source of conflict, like in working with the villain, I feel like for him to go ahead and do this and not really consider the implications of what he's doing, I feel like that's such a massive knock. Like, how could you be so dumb? And how could you be thinking that this is a good idea? You think the experience of turning his back on his friends and working with Tyrick only to get manipulated and betrayed would have resolved that issue and completed his redemption arc for the most part. But I feel like it was just a massive step back for him to go back to Tyrick, the same villain that already betrayed him, only to be shocked again when Tyrick, like, turns on him again. Now, granted, Tyrick didn't know it was Discord, but Discord should have definitely known by this point that Tyrick was definitely someone that wasn't going to be playing, like, by these friendship rules, by any stretch of the imagination. Like, it's just very idiotic and a sign of bad writing. So I feel like that alone is a pretty bad, I mean... Then after that, he goes to, like, the castle and, like, spills the beans on what he did. I mean, I feel like we get, like, kind of a similar issue, like, where Twilight starts having this arc of losing her confidence because she feels like that since Discord engineered this crisis, that he somehow was behind all these other crises that came before. And I can see, like, I can see some, why some people might like this, like, sort of an interesting arc for Twilight to go through. But again, I feel like that, like I feel like this is a general problem with a lot of these uh, two parters, and just in general episodes in the later seasons of the show, where a lot of its content and a lot of the issue, like the stuff that they try to do, just collapses under the weight of what came before it. And I feel like for Twilight here, like the fact that she's already been on all these adventures, the fact that she's already saved Equestria time after time after time only for her to completely lose her confidence because of this one incident. It's just kind of ridiculous to me. I mean, she's already solved like a number of different crises in the past. Like, like there was no way Discord was involved with those. So like, you know that you can save Equestria like without like Discord at all. Like, why is this one particular instance of him testing her and him kind of manipulating like her her growth like how is that completely destroying your confidence like it's kind of weird to me so like and i feel like that was definitely something where the that definitely hindered my enjoyment of it the first time i was watching it i feel like it was something like it just wasn't fun seeing her mope around and just be like oh i can't do anything so that was kind of weird and annoying i mean like I said, I mean, it just feels artificial to me. Like, that's just something, an issue that I have in general. I mean, I just didn't care as much. So, enough about that. Um, I guess there's also the resolution where the villains, like, aren't redeemed by the end of it. And instead, they get frozen in stone. I mean, and again, this includes Cozy Glow, who's a child. I mean, but taking everything out, this just feels like a strange way to end the series on i mean i mean you consider like what came before it i mean i mean yeah like you have like people like complain about how villains were getting redeemed and that type of stuff but you know like and we definitely you know i mean some of that is justified to some extent but i feel like and I, and again i'll talk about this a bit more when we talk about school rays like i feel like the fact that they use this as a way to resolve the conflict of having the villains not be redeemed and having them being turned as, into stone, it just feels like a big reaction from the writers. I feel like they were doing it not because it made sense thematically to end the entire series on, but more so to sort of prove to their audience that they're not just about redeeming villains, how they know that you can't redeem everyone and how it's not just this big fairy tale and they wanted to prove that by really laying the hammer down and trying to prove to everyone that they're not, you know, like above, like just punishing villains. 
you know, I, you know, I, I could take it or leave it with school race, but I feel like for here, the series finale where you really want to hammer home, you know, like the series theme one last time and really make it count. The fact that they didn't do it here and, you know, after doing it in other two parts before it, that caused a lot of the backlash. Like, I just feel like that was kind of weird to me that they didn't end the series that way. So I feel like that was kind of a misstep on their part. Um, and again, it feels arbitrary. So like, that's just another thing I felt, but I feel like aside from that, like, I know I've been talking a lot about the issues with the two parter, but I feel like there are some good things about it that keep it from being at the very bottom. I feel like the main one for me is how the villains had the strategy of not launching this frontal attack right out of the bat, but you like going around and really sowing mistrust and discontent among the populace to the point where you know, like magic becomes weaker and less effective. I feel like that was a very innovative way and unique way we hadn't really seen before. And I feel like the fact that, again, they put that in the last episode of the show, I feel like that makes it a very effective final test. You know, to have the entire population be demoralized and on edge and not trusting each other. It's kind of funny now, like, that we have G- Generation 5 out, like, how we have a very similar premise for that movie. So, that was kind of an interesting to see. And I feel like that was something that really increased my appreciation of the two parter. Uh, I realize I've already been talking for a while about this one, but. I feel like for me, it's a pretty mixed bag. Like there are some pretty massive flaws that I can't ignore. And the reason I have it down here, but there are also things that I appreciate about it. And I feel like upon rewatch, it wasn't as bad as what I remembered it being the first time. So because of that, I have it at number 12. Now at number 11, and I promise this one will be a bit shorter than the ending of the end. Um, we had, and it's a bit weird having this one like right after the ending of the end. But we have the season nine premiere. We have the beginning of the end, and I really thought about this one a bit and where it should go on the list, like and what I thought about it in general. Like it was kind of hard for me to pin down when I was watching it, you know, because I was wondering like whether I should have it higher, maybe I should have it lower. Like and whether I should have it right next to the season nine uh, counterpart for it, uh, but what I came down to, like, and the reason why I have it down here is just I feel like this is a less interesting version of Twilight's Kingdom, mainly because of its arc about Twilight being nervous about her new role, like, and trying to prove herself in some way that she's ready to become the ruler of Equestria. Like with Twilight's Kingdom, we have her being worried about. You know, like or being insecure about her role as a princess and how she's trying her best to fulfill that new role. You know, there's also King Sombra, who we finally see in action. And I'll admit, it was a nice idea to have Sombra be more out in front than what we saw in the Crystal Empire. But I don't know. I feel like I just liked him better when he was in the shadows. And a lot of his powers were, were more about mind control and psychological manipulation. Like, him being out in front like this just isn't as interesting to me. So that was one problem I had. Um, Then there's Discord, who gets a decent amount of foreshadowing here for his eventual reveal of him being Grogar, which we just talked about, and how he manufactured this entire situation. You know, in this episode, we at least see Discord as someone that could very easily put a stop to this whole conflict, chooses not to, because Twilight apparently needs to prove she was ready to take over Equestria. To me, that's not a step in the right direction for his character, and it does feel like a re- he's a reason why we're still getting these situations. But none of this is to say there aren't interesting aspects to this episode. I mean, for one, there's a scene in part two, after Sombra has taken over Ponyville, where each of the main six are worried specifically about their loved ones that are in danger. It's sort of weird how each of them like talk about a specific person, or character, like, and they go back to Ponyville and they see that very character being under, you know, like, Sombra's mind control. So that was a bit interesting to see, even if I felt it came out of nowhere. Um, you know, it's sort of weird how it took them nine seasons to see the main six act like this. Like, you know, like, they had the, you know, those same loved ones have been in danger, like, in all the other times, you know, like, they've, that the, 
that the fate of Equestria has been in danger, but it's sort of, you know, like, it's nice that we got it now, but it's kind of weird that, you know, like, at, after all these times, you know, like, it's only now that they're really worried about their loved ones being in danger. So, you know, I mean, it was an interesting scene, you know, like, of them talking to them, trying to get them to snap out of it. And along those lines, there's also the scene where they're trying to hold off the town ponies, like, when they're trying to get into the castle in Canterlot, and they'll and they're worried, like, because like they're trying to fend them off, but they're also trying not to hurt them. Like, you know, that was sort of an interesting scene. But I feel like outside of that, like, you know, this isn't a great two-parter. I think there are a lot of elements, you know, that could have been done better, like, and have been done better in other two-parters. But even so, like, I feel like I walked away from this one with a bit more than what I got in the other two-parters. Like, there are less flaws than other ones i feel like a lot of the i feel like the discord problem is something that i fault more with the ending of the end than with this one but you know it's still there to some extent and i feel like because of that because of those factors i can't really have below some of the other ones like i feel like i got more out of it but again it just didn't have as much strength to it as some of the other ones so i have it here at number 11 now we're at number 10 and this one was a bit interesting to think about not so not so much because I didn't have an opinion on it or because I didn't know what my opinion was but more so because I just wasn't sure where to rank it on this list and really a general problem I had with putting this list together is I couldn't decide whether to have actively bad uh two parters like at the bottom or whether I should have like less interesting ones below and i feel like with the selections i've already made that's become clear to you know to some of you that i've opted for the latter option of having less interesting uh two parters like at the bottom than ones that are more flawed but are also more interesting like you know like maybe bland's not the right word but you know like ones that don't have as much to offer but even if they are technically sound and don't have as many actively bad things going for it, then ones that I have more issues with, but also more things I enjoy out of that. And I feel like Crystal Empire is sort of one where there aren't as many technical issues with it, but there also aren't as many strengths going for it as some of the more polarizing ones. And here I got to put the Crystal Empire, the, season three premiere and the only season three two-parter and this one's pretty good like it has a lot of things i like with two-parters like the music's good like even if it's not as good as kind of what wedding but it's pleasant to listen to like i like the failure song you know like i feel like there are other interesting back backtracks to go with it I think that's similar to Friendship is Magic, there are elements to the special where the stakes feel lower than a lot of the other two parters. Like, while they're somber in the background the entire time, you don't really see him emerge until the end of part one. And even after that, like, much of his threat comes in the shadows or is off in the distance. And, you know, like I talked about in the beginning of the end, how I feel like that's better for Sombra than him being more out in front. But at the end of the day, I mean, it's still not that present in the grand scheme of the two-parter and like you know but even so like i have him above nightmare moon like i feel like there are more interesting elements to him um i feel like another thing that lowers the stakes is how the entire journey is framed as twilight being worried about passing this test like and how she's treating it a lot like the school test she, she would take in school where she would get a grade now, in hindsight, this is an important test. Like, you know, like, you know, Celestia uses it to determine whether to make Twilight's a prin princess or not. Like, you know, like, and obviously, I I think that just makes the entire plot feel like another adventure. Like, even though it has this grander implication that by the end of the season, I feel like when you're in the moment watching it, the fact that she's just treating it like a school assignment again just lowers the stakes. Doesn't make it feel as you know, like, high stakes, as you would see with other two, two-parters. Then there's the setting, the Crystal Empire, which is fine. I mean, I'm not sure how much it really adds to the show, other than giving Cadence something to do. I mean, well, I mean, it's that is rectified later in the series, but here we really don't get much about 
what the crystal empire actually is like as an entity like why are they settling like in the middle of the arctic like like what is their relationship to equestria like and what it, you know, like we get bits and bit, bits and pieces about the culture but again like i'm left with the question of how does the crystal empire like add to the show like what does it like why does it matter so much like so like i was left with those questions i think overall this two part doesn't really hit me that much i mean there are some great scenes like there's the whole sombra's nightmare door or, or worse fear door which i found very interesting like you know, like when Celestia tells Twilight, "You failed the test, Twilight." I mean, I mean that is a pretty awesome moment. But you know, like I feel like when compare, like when you're looking at the rest of the special, I mean, there just aren't as many memorable moments. You know, like outside of those. Now, I mean, that clearly comes out in the soft, easy going music, the slow pacing, the inclusion of plot elements we would see in normal episodes, like the test and the entire festival sequence. Like I haven't even talked about the festival festival sequence. Like, you know, it, you know, it didn't really do much for me there, you know, and also the fact that the whole side plot of them trying to hide that they don't have the crystal heart, like is literally repeated in the crystalline later on. I mean, so that was something else to consider. I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, I mean, I did like the special. I mean, I, again, I feel like I keep saying that for all of these. I mean, I do really do like most of these two-parters, but I feel like there are just other ones that are more impactful. With that said, I did enjoy this one more than the ones we've already talked about. So I have Crystal Empire at number 10. Now we're moving on to number 9. And like the ending in the end, this is one that I was expecting to be at the very bottom before my rewatch. Or at least very close to the bottom. But obviously now having rewatched it, my opinion has gone up and it's no longer at the bottom. We have the season eight finale. We have school raised. Now I'll admit that this is one of only two two parters that I only seen once before the rewatch, which was back when it first came out. And I'll admit that when I first saw it, like it was just something that I didn't really care much for. I thought there were pretty dumb elements to it. I felt like there was some weird stuff to it. And I feel like it just didn't do much for me. Um, you know, like obviously now having rewatched it, I have a higher opinion of it, but there are still some pretty big issues. I think the biggest issue is Cozy Glow, who compared to other villains is pretty underdeveloped. Like, now, I'll say up front that when I first saw her, like, in, was it, Marks for Effort, like, her first episode in season eight, I, I caught on pretty quickly that she would become a twist villain. I mean, there were plenty of signs there, like, such as, like, her fake accent, like, when she's crying, like, there's also, like, some of the answers that she gave when she was studying for the test, and I think the biggest one to me was when she was doing the flashcards, like, and she finally was starting to master them, like, and she got the magic, and the, you know, like, Twilight's cutie mark just was in her eyes, like, in her irises, like, like, I felt like that was a pretty giveaway sign that she was actually evil, like, but, you know, like, it took a couple episodes for that to be expanded upon, and obviously here we see the culmination of that, you know, like, but enough patting myself on the back, I mean, at the end of the day, she is pretty underdeveloped. Like, we don't really know anything about her, like why she's evil or where she came from or where the heck are her parents. I feel like she's only there, like she was only created because the writers wanted to experiment with having a twist villain. But aside from the fact that I could already tell she was a twist villain, I mean, I think she leaves like a number of questions behind. Like, I mean, aside from the ones I just mentioned, like... Like, how did she meet Tyrek? That's another great question to ask. I mean, I will, I, I'll admit, like, like, I wasn't expecting anything elaborate. Like, I'm not saying we needed, like, a five-minute backstory where we talk about, oh, here are my parents, or here's how I was raised, or here's how I came to believe that power, like, could come from friendship, you know, like, and that type of stuff. I'm not expecting anything elaborate, but maybe something, like, something to give us a little context over who she is like and why she's doing why she, what she's doing i mean i feel like i mean the episode right after her first appearance was the mean six where we see chrysalis still trying to take over equestria like i understand why they didn't want to do another changeling plot for cozy glow 
but she literally comes out of nowhere. I think the other thing you discussed with Kozugo is the fact that she isn't redeemed and is locked up in Tartarus at the end. Like, I mean, I just mentioned this with the ending of the end, but I mean, I won't, I, I must say it again. You know, like she is a child, you know, like in the fact, you know, the fact that they decide to punish her like this, you know, especially after this pretty long streak of redeeming villains, like, I feel like to me it comes off as reactionary. Like and I talked about this with the ending in the end, but it really, really felt like here that the writers like didn't like how people were complaining about the redeemed villains that we've gotten over the last few seasons. Like, and so they wanted to have Cozy glow around and they gave her this ending just to be like, see, we're not that type of show. We can make our villains pay for their actions. You know, while I can appreciate the show going in a different direction, the fact that they chose Cozy Glow, of all people, like, a, again, a child character with no backstory, you know, to lay down the law, lay down the law on, like, j again, just creates new questions. Like, why was Starlight, you know, like, a grown adult pony, why was she reformed when she's, like, at least doubled Cozy Glow's age and committed an arguably bigger crime than her? I mean... Have we forgotten that Starlight almost destroyed civilization using time travel? You know, why does Discord keep getting forgiven despite making mistake after mistake after mistake? Like, I mean, you know, and afterwards we had the whole Grogar situation. I mean, why was he forgiven after that? I mean, no one can say the Cozy Glow isn't redeemed simply because she doesn't want it. You know, like, but again, I feel like the fact that she is a child character you know, just, you know, like, completely undermines that assertion. Like, maybe she just didn't know that maybe she was just completely misguided with how she thought. Like, and I feel like the lack of a backstory suggests that, oh, well, if you have a sad backstory, then you are entitled to redemption. Like, well, you know, so, like, I feel like if people don't know you, then it just dehumanizes you to the point where it's easier for people to just, you know, like, you know, like punish you or whatever. And again, I feel like, you know, I feel like the fact that she is a child is a byproduct of them wanting a twist villain, you know, like to be like, see, she's a child. How can anyone, how can anyone ever suspect that she's a twist villain? Like, I feel like all these ideas just clash against each other and ultimately undermine like what they're trying to do. I mean, I, again, I can just see through the screen and see what the writers were thinking and what they were trying to accomplished with all this like and it's not for the service of making a strong sound narrative but now that i addressed the elephant in the room i must say that this two-part is all right aside from that like i did it i at least enjoyed watching cozy glow like win over the students to give her power like and again while she is underdeveloped like the her whole like idea of friendship being a source of power and being able to use friendship as a way to build influence and clout so that people can you know like help you with your ends like i feel like that's a very interesting way of looking at friendship that wasn't explored previously like with other villains like they either rejected friendship or were just straight up evil whereas cozy glow was someone that you know like you know like putting aside all those issues she is someone that bought into friendship and tried to like use it to her own game, which I think is an interesting examination to the downsides of friendship and how friendship, like a seemingly like good thing can be used as a tool to weaponize evil. Like, and I think that's an interesting challenge or at least idea for the show to play with, even if I don't think at the end of the day, they handle it particularly well. I mean, I don't feel like they really answered some of the questions that they set forth. And then there's also the idea of, of the creature six saving the day. I mean, it's interesting in concept. I mean, I, although in its execution, it was a bit underwhelming. They spent a decent chunk of the second part locked up in a room that's very easy to escape, by the way. I mean, once they got out of their chains, all they had to do was open the window you know, there's also the CMC, who are pretty useless in this episode. There's the main six, who sent a, a decent amount of the special locked in Tartarus. And even when they get out, like, it's only through the Creature Six saving the day that allows them to get back to the school in time. So, again, like, there are plenty of flaws with the special, even on the rewatch. But I think, like, when I thought about it more and more, there are just interesting ideas that the two-parters set forth, even if I don't think they were 
necessarily handled the best. Like, and again, I wasn't bored in the special. Like, I feel like there were plenty of things that had my attention going throughout a lot of it. You know, I haven't even mentioned Naysay, who has a redemption arc in this episode, and comes to realize that, hey, maybe racism isn't so good after all. So, you know, I mean, it's not the, you know, it's not the best special. I mean, it's not the most tight, tightly told story in the world, but I feel like, again, like after watching it and really thinking about like what it accomplished, like I feel like I can't justify putting it at the very bottom. So, oh man, I feel like I'm going on another ramp, but that's why I decided to put uh, School Raised at number nine. Now we're moving on to number eight, and this is easily the most controversial two-parter in the entire show. I mean, and for good reason. I mean, a lot of people don't like it or complain about it on YouTube. And, you know, like I will admit that there are a lot of flaws to this two-parter. But it's also one that I really enjoy a lot more than other people. And I think some of that stems from my enjoyment of Starlight. And I'm just going to go ahead and say it. At number eight, we have the season five finale, The Cutie Remark. Now, this was tough for me to assess, you know, because on one hand, I really do enjoy this special. Like, I think if you ask me whether I would watch this or other ones like Friendship is Magic or Crystal Empire, I think I would pick the Cutie Remark over a lot of those other ones to watch, like, just to pass the time and stuff. I think there's also a lot of great moments to it, and I think there are some interesting things that come out of it that really grip me and really have my attention and make me want to invest in what the story is saying. But at the end of the day, there's still a ton, a bevy of flaws that I can't ignore. And like, you know, let's talk about them. I think the first one is that the fact that it uses time travel, like I feel like time travel is an inherently flawed plot device to tell your story. I mean, I think like there are two big problems that I have with it. One being that it assigns unnecessary importance to specific events. Like it, I feel like it's arbitrary with which changes produces significant changes to the timeline and which ones aren't as important. I feel like that's sort of a weird arbitrariness that writers can choose to their convenience. And I think the other problem with these stories is that they ignore our collective tendency to seek equilibrium and to pursue other options in favor of assigning undue importance to specific individuals or trivial events. I think that plays out very well in a real world where what's to say that we couldn't be living in a more ideal timeline just because someone went back and changed one little thing. I think, you know, a lot of these time travel stories ignore that we as humans are capable of taking what we're given and making the most of it. So like, I feel like who's to say that we are living in the absolute best timeline. I think that's a big leap in logic that a lot of these time travel stories make, but you know, that's another story for another day. But my point is that MLP, you know, like this episode is very guilty of both of those things. I feel like it assigns undue importance to the sonic rain boom you know, like to the point where it's saying that if it didn't happen, then the entire fabric of society would fall apart. Like, again, you know, because one, it assumes that the main six are all important, which is kind of true based on the history of the show. But I think the bigger issue is the fact that it doesn't give an alternative for these characters to come together to have their community marks to become united in some other way. I mean, it just kind of assumes that without this one event, everything goes to goes to crap. So I think that that's an issue that the show has, but I'll admit that it, you know, it's not as bad as it could have been. I mean, it's just an inherent flaw of time travel stories. So that's why it doesn't quite bother me as much as some other two-parters, just because it has time travel. Still a problem, though. I think another problem I have with this episode is how it handles Starlight's backstory. I mean, I mean, you know, you get to the backstory in part two, and it's incredibly rushed. And it's very inadequate considering how much it impacts Starlight into adulthood. I mean, I'm not saying that it has to take up more than five minutes, but, you know, what it gave us leaves so many questions unanswered. I mean, where were Starlight's parents in all of this? Like, why couldn't Sunburst and Starlight keep in touch through letters? How did Starlight react when she got her own cutie mark? Like, was there resentment there? 
Was Starlight unable to make other friends before or after Sunburst? Did she even try? I mean, these are just questions I'm asking off the top of my head. I mean, like, I'm not expecting all of them to have been answered, but I feel like we really needed something here, considering what Starlight ends up doing with this backstory. The fact that she goes this far to with this whole cutie marks are bad mantra that she lives with throughout the show. So that's sort of a disappointment I had with the episode as well. Like, I feel like it makes it a bit hard for me to feel bad for Starlight. Like, you know, and then there's obviously Starlight's Redemption at the end, which doesn't upset me as much as a lot of other people. I know a lot of people really hate this redemption arc, and I feel like she should have been punished. I mean, you know, and I understand where they're coming from. I'll admit that the redemption itself isn't handled perfectly. But for the most part, I really enjoy that scene where Twilight takes Starlight out of the changing the past, and I like the song at the end. I'll, I'll admit it, I like the song at the end. It wasn't perfect, so I can't credit the episode too much for it. But I think taking all that aside, this again, this is a two-parter that I genuinely enjoy watching. You know, seeing the different timelines is interesting. I think Starlight is still a pretty compelling character, even if she isn't quite as interesting as she was in part one, I mean, or in the CUNY map. Like, she is involved with some of the episode's bigger issues. Obviously, that's another knock. Again, at the end of the day, I would rather rewatch this episode than a lot of the other ones. And, you know, like, while this list is partially taking into account ob objectivity, I think how I feel watching it and my personal feelings about it are something that draws me to it. And I think that is a factor in this list. Like, this isn't strictly, like, an objective list. So I feel like when I consider, like, how much it made me feel watching it, I think that's a reason why I have to put it at number eight. Now we're moving on to number seven, and I'll admit, like, I was surprised that this one did fall up here. Really, like, this entire list, like, yeah, it was very interesting going back and actually ranking a lot of these, like, and thinking about how I feel like a lot of these compare to each other. But at number seven, we have the season two finale we have a Canterlot wedding. Now, this one was a bit more difficult for me to assess. I mean, there are elements of this two-part that I enjoy. I mean, the music is something that comes to mind with some pretty good musical numbers. I mean, you know, like people, a lot of people talk about This Day's Aria as being this great song, and it is. I mean, I mean personally, I prefer BBBFF. I mean, that's more of the song that sticks to my head, but take that as, a, as you will. I also appreciate how this two-parter attempts to connect its bigger plot with smaller character stuff, like namely Twilight's relationships with Shining Arbor and Cadence. But I think there are also pretty clear flaws in Twilight's story. I mean, basically the moral of the episode is to follow your instincts, and Twilight is shown as being in the right for doing so, but when watching the episode, especially the first part, most of Twilight's issues with Cadence don't come off as her suspecting she's evil, although there's foreshadowing of that being the case, rather it comes more from Twilight believing that Cadence, Cadence has grown up to be a more selfish, not nice pony. I mean, that's a pretty reasonable gripe to have, even without the whole changeling side to it. Now, to the episode's credit, this makes it easier for me to understand the backlash that other characters throw at Twilight at the end of Part 1, but on the other hand, like the lack of evidence for Cadence being full-on evil, aside from one spell being cast, make the, makes the whole instinct message a bit weaker. It'd be one thing if Twilight had more evidence of Cadence's behavior being evil. Heck, I think it'd be better if, instead of hostility, Twilight viewed the behavior with shock, as if she couldn't believe Cadence had become such a rotten pony. Instead, Twilight immediately sours on Cadence as a whole, buying into the fact that she's become a jerk, whereas the other characters are in the wrong simply due to not paying enough attention to their surroundings. And really, to bring this whole thing front and center, I don't think Twilight is as likable in this episode as the writers intended. I think the fact that she gets so upset at Shining Armor for not letting her know about the wedding ahead of time, despite them living in separate, different cities, and the fact that Shining Armor is letting her play such a massive role within the wedding, genuinely feeds into the other character's perception that Twilight is possessive of her brother. And really, I don't blame the other characters for feeling that way, based on how Twilight active behavior from a realistic perspective. If this whole changeling business wasn't going on to back her up, you know, like in the events of part one, had to otherwise play out the same, I think Twilight is 100% in the wrong for the way she's acting. 
Granting Cadence would also be in the wrong for having grown up to be a jerk, but still, I think this is all a very long way of saying that the end result of the episode doesn't justify Twilight's mindset or behavior through part one. I, you know, aside from that, I mean, I think there are things to enjoy about this two-parter. I mean, really, that whole rant I just won was my biggest issue with the episode. I think there are some pretty good things up in this episode, like... You know, Chrysalis is a pretty compelling villain. The, the changelings are a pretty interesting species to introduce in this episode. You know, you know, admittedly, Cadence and Shining Armor, like, you know, they're not the best in the world. I mean, I mean, they're not super interesting, but, you know, they serve their purpose. You know, and it's kind of cool to see the villain get stopped from something other than the Helens of Harmony. Like, well, I think love is a pretty vague concept in general, especially when compared to friendship. It's separate enough from the other elements to where I'm fine with it. Plus, it's a wedding episode, so it makes some sense that this got, gets brought up. So, really, I think this episode is pretty good for the most part. And like, although I think there's one pretty big flaw with it, that you know, like that being Twilight and her behavior. Like, but I think outside of that, I think there are plenty of things to enjoy this episode. And I would say that this is a genuinely compelling two-parter to watch. So. Even if not everything works, I still feel good putting this one at number seven. Now we're moving on to number six, and I'll admit I'm a bit surprised that this one is this high, as a lot of people don't talk, really talk about this one, and it's one the, I'd say one of the more forgotten two-parters in the grand scheme of things. But at number six, I have the premiere of season six. That's the crystalline. This was a pretty solid two-parter, and it's, it's definitely the better one of those set in the Crystal Empire. For me, what really makes this episode is Starlight's plot plotline of rekindling your friendship with Sunburst. As I talked about with the Cootie remark, I don't think Starlight's actual redemption is handled particularly well, but I find her portrayal in this episode pretty fascinating. She has an easier time with being friendly and not falling on some of the character traits that made her an antagonist. Which, I'll admit, it's a bit of a nitpick, as it kind of makes Starlight feel like a, a completely new character here. But this episode, along with Star Starlight's pre future episodes in Season 6, really highlight her guilt over being forgiven for her past misdeeds. I think it shows up in interesting ways, like how she tries stalling and delaying the moment where she finally has to face Sunburst. There's also the parallel of Sunburst trying to hide the fact that, leaving from magic school... The main thing that separated them didn't pay off in the end. Like, or certainly not as much as Starlight would have liked. And when Sunburst reveals this to her in part two, it makes sense why Starlight gets mad and dumps her own past onto him, as this information strips away the only semblance of an upside that all the pain and suffering she went through from being separated from him may have had. Overall, there were some fine interactions with Starlight and Sunburst, you know, like, and that's really the highlight of this episode. I also think her relationship with Spike is pretty interesting as well, and there are actually some interesting Season 6 episodes that explore that relationship further, so I thought that was pretty interesting as well. Now, the main plot of this episode is kind of alright. I mean, there wasn't much of a villain, so much as Flurry Heart's unpredictable magic burst being a generator of conflict. It, it was kind of annoying in a way where it seems like they needed something to generate conflict, so they just have Flurry Heart do something that does just that, like breaking the crystal heart or later on where she's, you know, she burns the book that Twilight was using to try to get a spell that would help her fix the crystal heart. In some ways, part two kind of feels like a retread of Crystal Empire where Rainbow Dash and the other main characters are trying to keep the crystal ponies from finding out that the crystal heart isn't there. Although I think this episode does that concept better than Crystal Empire. Aside from that, there aren't really any major flaws that knock this episode down too much. I mean, I know that I talked a bit earlier about how I tend to rank uh, episodes that aren't as interesting lower. But I feel like unlike Crystal Empire, this episode does have some things that drive me in. I think if it wasn't for the Starlight and Sumber stuff, I think this episode would be considerably lower. But with that stuff there to really make this episode shine... I think number six is a pretty fitting spot for this two-parter. Now we're moving on to number five, and I feel like from this point on in the list, the five two-parters that we still have to talk about are all great in my eyes. I feel like this is the top tier of two-parters in my eyes, and I feel like if I actually just made this the top five list, these are probably the ones that would make it. 
Uh, I feel like I get the most enjoyment from these. I feel like in some of these, like I get similar amounts of enjoyment to some of the ones that we've already talked about, but they don't have the same major issues that those other ones had that keep them a bit lower. So number five, I have the least strong of these five or the least enjoyable of these five, but this one's still very good. It is the season five premiere, the cutie map. I think this is a solid enough two-parter, all things considered. Now, similar to Crystal Empire, this is one of the specials where the stakes feel lower than the other ones. In fact, I believe the overall threat level here is the lowest of any two-parter, where it's really just Starlight in her town in the middle of nowhere. While Starlight talks about how Twilight giving up her cutie mark would expand her movement nationally, most of the special is really confined to what happens in the village. In it, it, but in any case, I think this is a decent introduction for Starlight, where she gets does a decent amount, decent enough job, I should say, of putting up this happy face despite being really prone to anger and other deceitful acts. I also think this two-part is a good job in introducing multiple new characters aside from Starlight through the village, the most significant of which being Sugar Bell, who obviously becomes a bit of a bigger character later on. They definitely make the village more unique as a location than the Crystal Empire. Like, I feel like that comes out through the characters that we meet along the way. You know, the song, while not my favorite, is pretty good and fits in with the rest of the special. Now, where I think the two-parter does falter a bit is with Starlet being exposed as a hypocrite for still having her cutie mark. Maybe it's just me, but I think, I, I don't know. I feel like this is a cliche used in many similar stories focusing on cults or other extremist movements. To me, it feels like a cheap way of discrediting the movement's underpinning ideology without actually contending with the flaws inherent in that ideology. Granted, Starlight explains that she needed her magic to use the spell to remove the other's cutie marks, you know, which should be seen as a practical compromise for what's supposedly a genuinely held belief, which is explored more in the cutie remark. Uh, however, instead of following that up with, I promise that once everyone is converted, I will use the spell myself, or I'm working hard to develop a method that would remove cutie marks without requiring me to use magic, she goes down the typical route of exposing herself as really power-hungry. Granted, you know, there is signs of her just being power-hungry, but when you, like, put that up against, like, her backstory and how she genuinely believes cutie marks are harmful, I feel like we're kind of getting mixed messages here. I guess it's sort of the Discord issue of making her complicated without you know, providing a whole lot of clarity there. So I think that was kind of a problem I had with the episode. Um, but again, it's not as big as some of the other ones that, you know, like some of the other ones I've already had. And again, reducing cult power to power-hungry hypocrites doesn't really break down the flaws of the ideology at the end of the day. But to me, this is, I don't know. I mean, it's still a flaw because it's a blatantly missed opportunity that, you know, isn't explored more thoroughly until the cutie remark. You know, but at the end of the day, I think the special does enough to imply that the other town ponies had their cutie marks taken by fours and that their brainwashing isn't absolute. Also, I really enjoy the climax of this two-parter where they allow Starlight to escape while setting up her eventual return at the end of the season. I think this is a solid special, a solid premiere that introduces like a new you know, like mechanic with the cutie map. You know, like I think it's a bit... It's a bit difficult to talk about this episode in isolation, you know, I guess as it's very related to stuff that happens later on in this series. Like, again, a lot of that comes from the fact that it's related to the cutie remark far more than I see Princess other specials like Princess Twilight Sparkle and Twilight's Kingdom being related. And while this special has plenty of good things going for it, you know, there are some slow points. Like, I, I wasn't a huge fan of the beginning of part two where they're just hanging out, where they're locked in the house just waiting you know, to be reformed, like, that was kind of boring, you know, so it's not perfect, but I still really enjoy this one, and because of that, I have Cutie Map at number five. Now we're moving on to number four, and we're actually talking about an episode I just mentioned. It is the season four premiere, Princess Twilight Sparkle. Now, I did have a debate with this one between whether I should have it above or below Lot Wedding, which is a couple spots down, like, I think both of them are pretty good, albeit one with flaws that are clear to point out. And of course, this is a companion piece to Twilight's Kingdom, which we'll be talking about soon, where both deal a lot with Twilight coming into her own as a princess. 
So I think those similarities made me think a bit about where to place it. But I think if we're looking at the rest of the special, I think there's a lot to enjoy about it. And I think, you know, like re- when you know, when thinking more about the flaws of it, I think the flaws here aren't as blatant, you know, like, and they're not as bad as what we see in, you know, a Camelot wedding. But if we're looking at the special, a lot of it is focused on Twilight trying to solve this crisis. Only now she also has the baggage of being a princess and her friends treating her differently as a result. There's plenty of good stuff to pour over there, you know, like such as her friends like wanting to go into the every forest and sending her back, you know, like, and her trying to take over once Celestia you know, Luna disappear, like all that stuff's great. Uh, now for the negatives, I think the reveal at the end of how these vines came about was pretty underwhelming in my eyes. Considering that the antagonist is usually one of the more interesting aspects of the shoot parter, these out of control vines just didn't do it for me. Like I was kind of underwhelmed. Like really? That was it? Also, I think the flashback of Celestia banishing Luna to the moon, like while it's a great scene, like with a lot of emotion and talk attached, when you really think about it, I mean, a lot of it's just filler. Well, yeah, you know, again, it's a cool action scene, but I just didn't really see the point of it, like, within the episode. I also wasn't a huge fan of Discord in this episode. Like, this is the first time we're really seeing him since his redemption. And I get that the whole point is that he works in weird ways and that the main cast doesn't particularly trust him. And I already talked about that when I was talking about the season nine two-parters. Still, I think Discord as a whole is a character I've soured on over time. You know, and adding to the fact that the reveal at the end was underwhelming, I wasn't too amused by what he had to offer. On the whole, I think the special was pretty effective in do- doing what it's trying to do. I think it was trying to accomplish more than some of the other ones I talked about earlier, like Friendship's Magic. And while, yes, there are problems with the special, you know, I decided to have it pretty high because I feel like it was a case where the downsides to this episode just weren't as blatant and they weren't as big as some of the other ones that we've talked about. And I think the pros of this episode, the strengths of it are strong enough to elevate it to number four. Like I really enjoy how this becomes a season long arc of Twilight trying to grow into her own as a princess, you know, like through her taking on more responsibility and her learning to not see things like in the book or learning that there's more going on in the world than just her being friends at this point. You know, like when I think about it in relation to like other episodes, I'll admit that Twilight's Kingdom does do this plot better, and we'll be talking about Twilight's Kingdom soon enough. Um, there's a Camelot wedding where, again, I had that debate in my head over where where to put it, but I feel like you know, like despite Camelot wedding having more go- going for it, I feel like its flaws were also bigger to the point where I couldn't have it above this one. You know, so all those things made me really think about it, and I decided that Princess Twilight Sparkle is pretty good, you know, again, better and less flawed than those ones. So because of that, I decided to have it here at number four. Now we're moving on to number three, and I'll admit that when I first watched this one, you know, like, I, I placed it relatively high on my rankings, Um, but I was... Well, what I was more surprised by was how well it held up, like as I was watching more of the episodes, more of the two parters and seeing how well it held up. You know, and it's a bit weird thinking now that it's this high, but I think upon further examination that it does deserve to be there. And we have the season two premiere. We have the return of Harmony. Now, I feel like this was just an all around great special for the most part. And the first one in the series where the stakes are really felt throughout we're introduced to Discord, and we really get to see his powers on full display. It's really insane to think about how powerful he is, where he has the power to corrupt each of the main characters, but chooses to make it a game in the process. Now, the reasoning for Discord breaking free is a bit questionable. I mean, supposedly the transfer of the elements from Celestia to the main six made them weaker somehow. Did Celestia fail to prepare for this? I mean, that was a bit weird and a bit suspect. And then again, you can say that about a lot of the other two parts. So I won't hold it that much against this one, but still a little weird. Most of the first part is spent on the game and the labyrinth, which is a pretty iconic sequence. And I think one still holds up pretty well. Now, I will admit that some of the corruptions are handled better than others. Like Applejack's is okay, but it was a bit rushed. Pinky's is pretty good. I mean, I felt like Rarity succumbed way too easily to hers. 
Fluttershy's was a bit of a joke. I mean, but at least it was funny. And Rainbow's was okay, but I found it weird how the dilemma was over Cloud Sail being destroyed when her devotion to Cloud Sail hadn't really been developed in this episode, or really up at all up to that point. In general, I feel like these corruptions had a good understanding of the dark sides of the elements, which is really something that fascinated me a lot when watching it. You know, like, I'll, again, I'll admit that not all the corruptions were handled well, but again, I, again, it's the idea, and I think the execution was still all right. And then there's Twilight's corruption, which happened in part 12, part two, when she realizes that magic can only be powerful when there's friendship and harmony to back it up. So, again, that was something. Overall, I say the journey that Twilight goes through in healing her friends was pretty good. The chaos world was fine, even if I didn't find it at all all the stuff thrown in to be that interesting and again some of it was just random and just fed into the this weird random meme culture of the time which i don't think holds up super well i mean not i mean i wouldn't meme it nowadays but that's just me you know like you know and at, and at the end you know discord is done in more by complacency than anything else which i also found pretty interesting he never seemed to put up much of a fight probably because of overconfidence in his abilities so once he got the elements to work again, the conflict was resolved very quickly. You know, and then we got that Star Wars reference at the end, which you know, take it or leave it. I think overall, like I don't, again, I've had very few flaws with this one. I think I think it's pretty sound technically speaking and narratively. And I think there's again a lot to you know, like unpack with some of the stuff that explores like how the you know how the elements can be corrupted and how certain characters can become easily become the antithesis of themselves and i think through that you know there's a lot to enjoy there so because of that i decided to have it here at number three now we're on to number two just two two parters left and i'm sure some of you might be able to narrow down which ones those are uh but for this one i mentioned this earlier where school rate but this is one of the ones that I'd only watched once when it first came out. You know, at the time, I didn't care too much for it. I mean, it was fine, but I didn't really resonate much with it. But really on the rewatch and really thinking about it more and more, I started to realize how good this two-parter was and how good it was and how many good moments it had in it. So at number two, I have the season six finale to wear him back again now this two-parter again it's very interesting and it's sort of weird how i went this long without watching it again and at the time you know you know at the time i thought it was whatever you know like which is again how i thought season six was as a whole like i wasn't super high on season six at the time and i might do a season ranking somewhere down the line but I'll admit that season six is one of those seasons where my overall opinion of it has gone up over time. And I think to wear him back again is the epitome of that. Now, like, I feel like my appreciation for it has gone up significantly. And I think Starlight Glimmer is a big reason why that's the case. So, yeah, so I was getting something that I wasn't expecting the first time. You know, the concept of having all these redeemed characters coming together to single-handedly save the day is pretty interesting and a nice break from what we've gotten and all the two parts before it. You know, we have Starlight, who kind of completes her development in this episode by learning to be confident as a leader for good instead of evil. You know, at the beginning of the season, the crystalline, we see her come to terms with the root cause of her downward spiral, that being her friendship with Sunburst. Now it's kind of fitting that now she's coming to terms with the consequences of that downward spiral, namely her leadership skills being used for manipulation and wrongdoing. It somewhat addresses the fact that Starlight feels like such a different character between Season 5 and Season 6, particularly when it seems like she's lost all her self-confidence in that gap. It's as if she was trying to distance herself from her evil past and repress any instincts or qualities that can be associated with it, even if those things aren't inherently bad. Now, granted, I think Starlight's story in The Crystalline is slightly stronger in concept than her story here. However, I think the story makes up for that with its presentation. We see that through the dream sequences where Starlight imagines being rejected by the town ponies. We also see that she has a panic attack when the town ponies try to put her in charge of the festival. All of it feels pretty nice, in my opinion. 
the rest of the redeemed characters are pretty good as well. I think Discord is more likable in this episode than most others. I also think the changelings themselves are more interesting than they were in a Canterlot wedding. While that episode did a decent job of building up the threat level through the increased defense measures in Canterlot and the plausible deniability in Cadence's behavior, here I think the buildup is a bit more surprising, and I enjoy watching the changelings attempt to act like ponies, only to be slightly off in the process. It was interesting to say the least. You know, and, and again, I know some people might think that maybe having this one a bit too high, you know, but I just think when watching it, there's a lot of great things to it. I mean, aside from all the thematic stuff and all the character stuff, there's plenty of fun scenes inside the hive as the gang tries getting to the throne room. You know, I feel like there are very few flaws with this one, and I think there's a lot there to unpack and a lot to really enjoy when watching this two-parter. So as crazy as it seems, I mean, I have to wear him back again, ranked at number two. And now, finally, we've reached number one. The best two-parter in Friendship is Magic for me is, and this should be pretty obvious at this point, the season four finale, Twilight's Kingdom. Now, I'll admit up front that this has a special place in my heart. I mean, it was the first two-parter to come out after I had gone into the into the fandom after I started watching the show. You know, again, it was the first two-parter that I watched live. And really, at the time, it was very exciting seeing this episode play out and it was very exciting seeing how it affected the status quo moving forward. You know, and there's also the fact that there was, what, a, like an 11-month hiatus after this episode came out, which really made me feel like I was missing the show at that point. So, like, I think all those factors really played into my enjoyment of it at the time, but at the same time, it was also a reason why it made it difficult for me to separate that nostalgia from its actual merit. It made me question whether this one really deserved to be a number one. But I think after this rewatch and really thinking about it more and more, I think number one is where this episode belongs to me. I think it's a top tier episode of the entire show. And it's definitely worthy of being the best episode, a two-part episode, I should say, in this grouping of episodes. Now, to get some, some stuff out of the way, I will admit up front that there's a decent amount of stuff there that's meant to feel more cinematic than substantive. I mean, this is easily the most action-packed episode in the entire show. It's the one that tries the hardest to feel epic and greater than itself, and you know, I, as I said earlier, that's something that you know, a lot of these two parters are trying to accomplish, which is to feel like it's more than just this regular episode that's just been extended. There's also the super transformation scene later in the episode where it literally happens. It comes out of nowhere, doesn't have much explanation, and it never shows up again aside from a quick line that Pinky has in season eight. Again, I can see how... And all this is unnecessary. It is unnecessary. And I can see how, again, it can feel like fluff and kind of ridiculous when you're watching it. But I feel like none of that takes away from how incredible this episode is. As I talked about with Princess Twilight Sparkle, I think this two-parter handles the princess arc much better. Obviously, it's booned by the fact that we have an entire season of the show to back up Twilight's feelings and how her princess role hasn't amounted to much. But even within the episode, this character arc is much more central and focused than what it was in Princess Twilight Sparkle. You'll Play Your Part is one of the best songs in the entire series, and it very much serves the story of the episode. Then there's the Discord stuff, which is pretty interesting for the most part. You can really tell that the two of him and Tyrik really have a history together. And it's pretty cool seeing how Tyrik is able to manipulate Discord by avoid by telling him that friendship is simply a different form of imprisonment. I think that stuff is great. Now, I think where you can fault this episode a, a bit is that I think Celestia puts way too much faith in Discord to apprehend Tyrik, when Discord himself hasn't given anyone much reason to trust him. The episode explains that Discord was sent because he would be able to detect when Tyrik steals someone's magic, However, that doesn't explain why Celestia or some other princess couldn't have chaperoned him to ensure no funny business occurred. And by the end, he essentially gets a slap on the wrist for working with Tyrik. 
And I'll admit, those are knocks you can get the episode. But I also think the episode does a good enough job at showing Discord to be committed to friendship, even as he's helping Tira take over Equestria. It seems like the main reason Discord even agrees to be involved with Tyrek is not to make his friend think that he's gone soft. You know, like he really wants Tyrek's approval as a person. And at the end, he feels betrayed by Tyrek because he's really thought Tyrek would be his friend once this was all over. So like I said, it's not perfect. Uh, I mean, I, I wouldn't fault it too much as I think Celestia's incompetence is, again, a problem most of these two parties face. I mean, we can literally run through every single one if we have to of showing Celestia either being incompetent or pretty useless. And really, I'm not as bothered by this slip up as I am by others. I mean, I talked about before about how Discord isn't a character I particularly like, but I feel like here we actually see like the full extent of Discord like reasonably turning on the elements only to be betrayed and have a turnaround, although that's kind of ruined later by season nine. Again, I think on the whole, this is a very strong two-parter. Tiarko is a great villain. I mean, not the most complex villain, but he's a gr- good villain that kept me interested the entire way through. Twilight's arc of growing into her princess role is also pretty strong, I think this two-parter does a great job of making the experience feel cinematic. Like, it's like a movie almost when you're watching it. So, you know, and again, not all of it's necessary, but I think it ultimately embodies what a two-parter should be, which is to make you more excited about the universe, more excited about the show, to feel like the stakes of the show are higher, can be higher sometimes, and how these characters can do things that they may not necessarily be able to do within the confines of a regular episode. So for all these reasons, like in others, like I have Twilight's Kingdom as the best two-parter in MLP. So there we go. Those are all 15 two-parters of MLP ranked from worst to first. I mean, I'll admit this was a bit of an impromptu thing. I mean, I haven't really been involved much in the YouTube scene. Like, and I put this list a while together a while back, and at first I decided I was going to post it on Reddit, but then I decided, you know what, maybe I should record it and put it up on YouTube. So I thought that was something to be, uh, I thought that would be a bit of a fun project to put together. I mean, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I mean, I might do videos like these in the future. I mean, you know, like, if you really liked it, I mean, go ahead and let me know. I mean, it's something that I thought was fun putting together. I mean, hopefully I can make more videos like this, like, very soon. Like, talking about things that I like, like, more top top 10 lists or, like, ranking videos and that type of stuff. So, there we go. That is the video.